You are tuned into The Dr. Tina Show with Dr. Tina Moore. For more, visit drtina.com. On this episode of The Dr. Tina Show, this is going to be a quick and dirty episode. It is my 201st episode of this show, so I'm very excited, and thank you for being here. If you're new, thank you for joining. If you have been here the whole time, thank you so much for being on this journey with me. I can't believe it's been 200 episodes. What a crazy time. I have a very exciting uh, article to report, so we're going to break this down today. This just came out March 2025. It is from the Journal of Diabetes Care. It is volume 48. You can access it yourself for free on the internet. It's called One Size Does Not Fit All, Understanding Microdosing Semaglutide or Semaglutide for Diabetes in Multidose Pens. I'm really excited that this is out. This is in a medical journal, a renowned, respected medical journal. Um, It was written by respected endocrinologists. And this is an opinion piece. This isn't a medical study, but it is in a medical journal, so we can talk about it. And I'm not sure that I can take you know, any credit for this whatsoever, but I feel like I've had a huge part in this conversation. I took the heat early on when nobody else was willing to, to have this discussion. Now, before I get into this, I do want to say this was never meant to be a diabetes treatment, nor was it ever meant to be a weight loss strategy. And I talk about that in depth inside of my course. I have a big course on the topic. It's for clinicians. It's for practitioners. I also let the general public in. I've made sure that it's friendly for both groups. And because I have a lot of really smart people who follow me and they need to become empowered, they need to learn this information because their doctors don't know it. So I really encourage you to check that out. I've got a free four-part video series called GLP-1s Uncovered that will lead you into the big course, and then you can dive into the big course if you're interested from there. So if you go to drtina.com, that's D-R-T-Y-N-A forward slash Ozempic Uncovered, that's what it used to be called, then, but I cover all the GLP ones in there. So we had to change the name. And then that will lead you into the bigger course if you're interested, because I don't think GLP ones in a silo work. I think this is nonsense to think that they will. And I'm excited that this has been written up, but it's still very short sighted in that A, I don't think that microdoses are going to last long for type 2 diabetes as being effective. And I don't think they're going to really make a negligible mark on obesity or weight loss. So you can lose a few pounds here and there, but I think, and this is a conversation for another day, but I think that the Medi spas and the people advertising that you can microdose for weight loss are completely missing the mark and they are going to regret what they've said because eventually that microdose stops working. I know this because anybody that I've worked with who has lost weight on these at a very small dose inevitably needs a higher dose to keep the weight off if weight loss is the actual goal. So I want to say this again with conviction. This was never meant to be a weight loss strategy. It does induce weight loss in those who are already metabolically optimized and who are just dealing with a tiny little bit of insulin resistance, maybe due to menopause or due to aging or due to, you know, an illness they just had. So please do not take this home thinking. And I I even think that these clinicians or these uh, endocrinologists may find themselves in the same pickle. I don't think that microdosing is a strategy for either diabetes or weight loss long-term. But the exciting part that they are acknowledging is that sometimes we need to use more personalized, smaller doses to onboard people, or maybe we need to titrate them up more slowly to the more standard dosing. And I think with type 2 diabetes and with weight loss, what I've seen clinically is folks really do need a more standardized dose. So anybody who's telling you they're microdosing for weight loss, I don't really think they get it. What they're doing in most cases, and a lot of clinicians, including my friends, have come at me and said, we've been doing this for years, Tina. You didn't pioneer anything. Au contraire. I'm trying to have a conversation over here about all the myriad of benefits that GLP-1s in tiny increments may help with. However, they've been using standard low dosing So maybe the first one or two tiers of the standard dose, they do not bring people up slowly up to that dose. They hit them with the standard dose and then they might go one tier above and they're calling that microdosing. That is not microdosing. That's just low dosing. You're just standard low dosing. That's not at all the conversation I've been trying to have, but unfortunately the conversation about weight loss has dominated all of this and the type 2 diabetes weight loss conversation is always the overriding point that people want to discuss no matter what podcast I'm on. So I'll go deeper into that another day, but I think the inmates are running the asylum here. However, this paper is exciting, and I'll just cover some of the highlights. 
basically what they're proposing is that we may need to veer from standard dosing and consider that we might want to use a microdose or a smaller dose. Now, I don't think that using a half dose of a GLP-1, the half standard starting dose is a microdose. When I say microdose, I mean a fifth to a tenth of the starting dose, but they're calling it microdosing. I'll just call it that low, low dosing. And when you get to the standard starting dose, which is what a lot of doctors are advertising as microdosing and a lot of telemedicine companies are advertising as microdosing, again, that standard starting dose or that next tier up, that's not microdosing, guys, at all. You're not microdosing. If you're taking your full dose and you're splitting it up into smaller doses throughout the week, you're not microdosing. That's a big thing I've seen on TikTok. None of that's microdosing. Microdose is a mere fraction of what the standard dose would be considered. That is not the same thing as what's being discussed anywhere that I'm seeing in the medical articles that I'm reading, in the uh, big publications that continue to interview other doctors who steal my verbiage and literally plagiarize my words. And they get, I get zero credit and that's okay. Chaps my hide a little bit, but what I think more notably chaps my hide is the fact that they're just getting it completely wrong. So let's dive into this one. So the following scenarios should be considered for clinical application of microdosing. Um, first of all, they just to back up, they talk about, you know, the surge in demand for GLP-1s has resulted in intermittent global shortages and gaps in therapy. Maybe somebody's gotten acutely ill and they can't take their full dose, or maybe they've been in the hospital, or maybe, you know, different scenarios where they might need to use a smaller dose than what they're normally doing. Maybe they need to make their pens last longer because they can't access it. There's all different kinds of, of uh, issues here. Cost, obviously, access would be the two big ones. And what they propose is transitioning between a GLP-1 uh, receptor agonist. Microdosing can help patients transition to a new GLP-1 receptor agonist through gradual dose adjustments to improve therapeutic response. I would agree with that. Dose escalation or de-escalation. Microdosing supports a controlled titration or taper to safely adjust for necessary dose changes. Poor tolerability for patients with severe GI side effects, starting with microdosing and increasing slowly can improve tolerability and prevent therapeutic disruption. And for cash payers or people who are paying out of pocket, maybe they can extend the life of their pen, reducing the cost. So again, they're pretty much using this as an on-ramping method. It's not a microdose. It, it might be, um, but it's not in the application I was trying to discuss it for, but that's neither here nor there. We're just trying to help people out. The most exciting part is this. On page two of this very short opinion piece is a whole chart. It's a graphic. And this is why I'm excited, you guys. We can use the pens to microdose. We can use the pens to microdose. It's called the pen click method. I just read about it a few weeks ago in an article on Medline, I think it was. And then they referred to an article from a few years back when they were talking about this pen click method, which I've never heard of, where you just dial the pen a certain amount of clicks to get the dose that you're looking for. And based on the amount of clicks, they give you the actual dosage that that would be. And this is very exciting. This means we can use the pens to microdose and we don't have to be so reliant on the compounded pharmacy versions nor do we have to do necessarily the vial versions that the two big companies have released that we could consider if, if you're getting access to these peptides or medications through your insurance and they're paying for it, um, you actually can utilize the pens to give yourself a lower dose. How you want to dose, why you want to dose at a lower dose, what your short-term goals, what your long-term goals, all of that matters and that dictates what... I would ever suggest somebody do. I'm never going to suggest here on the internet. That's medical advice on the internet, which is ridiculous. But inside my course, I talk about my clinical rationale as to how and where to start and what that looks like and where do you go from there and uh, talking about cycling or, or doing different strategies inside of that clinical rationale. So there's more to this. And it's a comprehensive treatment plan that allows this one peptide to work. I really don't think putting somebody on a GLP-1 solo is going to be the solution. Again, I don't think it's going to work for very long. Even if they're using it at high doses, I don't think it's going to work for very long forever. You have to have a comprehensive treatment plan. At the very least, you have to be lifting weights and you have to be hitting your protein macros. But there are other peptides. There's HRT, which is hormone replacement therapy. There's a lot of other factors to consider here. And ultimately, the person has to be living 
an insulin sensitive lifestyle. And I go deep into that and what that looks like and how to phase through that, how to phase your patients through that uh, inside my course. So I will make sure that the link to this article is in the show notes so you can check it out. Just very exciting that the concept of microdosing has made it to mainstream and it's made it into a medical journal. So here we are, and I will take a little bit of credit for that. And then, and then who, you know, boo ya to everyone who's ran with this and the doctors who are realizing that a more personalized approach is the way to go, whether they're using it for other things or whether they're utilizing it for what it is FDA approved for, which is the on-label use of uh, obesity and type 2 diabetes. But just note, we are allowed to use medications off-label, totally legal thing to do. And especially at the small, tiny doses I'm talking about, I, I really don't see a lot of risk or concern. But that's up to your risk tolerance and up to your physician. So you need to be working with somebody. I have a whole module inside the course on how to find a physician to work with and what that looks like. I talk about my favorite compounding pharmacies, and I'm even going to be adding in a segment on more specifically on weight loss, even though I say this is not a weight loss strategy. I do want to explain how I would approach weight loss with more standardized dosing, how to do it right so that we're not just burning out a person's metabolism. And then even some of my uh, online telemedicine companies that I've talked to and vetted out. I don't make a dime off of any of them. And I'm proud to say that. I just have wanted to vet some of them out so that you guys can find out who is better to work with than not, like who's going to get you what you need and who understands what's going on. So I will leave all of that in the show notes. Uh, thank you so much for being here, you guys. And go check out the article. It's pretty exciting. And then if you want my four-part video series for free, it's drtina.com, D-R-T-Y-N-A, forward slash Ozempic Uncovered. And then from there, you can check out the course at a discounted rate for a limited time. All right, I'll see you guys later. Thanks for listening to The Dr. Tina Show. This is a Wellness Loud production produced by Drake Peterson and mixed by Mike Fry. Theme song is by John the Guilt. You can watch the full video version of this podcast inside the Spotify app or on YouTube. As always, you can email the podcast at podcast at drtina.com. That's D-R-T-Y-N-A. And if you like this episode, please rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast app. You can also find all of my offerings on my website at drtina.com. For more shows by my team, go to wellnessloud.com. See you next time and thanks for listening. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. It does not constitute the practices of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. I am a doctor, but I am not your doctor. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is intended not to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions.